Marcus Mosley was born in pre-civil rights era Texas, where his mother raised him immersed in the Southern gospel tradition. A much sought after performer in the musical and theatrical arts, Marcus brings his infectious gospel sound to concerts around the globe. Marcus views music as an important agent for healing and therapeutic in all stages of life, believing we each have a musical child within. He reflects, music helps us get in touch with our commonalities and reminds us who we are and what we aspire to be. Welcome to Family 360. It's been a while since we released an interview with a musician. Mm. I enjoy going back into that kind of perspective. (laughs) That kind of perspective. And <laughs> no. what would that be, speaking as a musician oh, myself? I'm thinking poetic, looking at life through a oh, rhythmic or a pulsing come on, come on, come on. It's ah. really hard to put musicians <laughs> and artists into a set perspective. Oh, okay, perspective is the wrong word then. It's how we come at the conversation that's unique. Are you still trying to dig your way out? <laughs> yep. No. I love <laughs> I love these interviews. You know what it is? When we interview musicians, I'm less aware of where the conversation is heading. Hmm. And I like that sense of surprise. Well, that's true because musicians kind of chase surprise. Hmm. Reminds me of a Miles Davis quote, think of a note, hmm. don't play it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to chase that is to foster the unexpected. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Marcus is well known for his music and his artistry, but also for using music as a restorative practice. Even therapeutic, which he does share in this interview. And musicians fuel their artistry out of their experiences in their life. Uh, so when we chat, uh, we, we not only get their thoughts about a subject, but we get their lives in as mm. well, almost like biographical. And that often makes the conversation a winding road, yeah. as it was with Marcus. So here's our meandering. And substantial. And, and yes, conversation with Marcus Mosley. Enjoy. I've been formulating this idea that whatever it is that you need, give it. Because I think there's a myth that there's not enough. There's a myth of scarcity that pervades in the world. Mm. There's abundance in the world. Everything we need is here. So if I want love, I give love. If I want compassion, I must give compassion. That's where it starts. I'm Rachel Cram. And I'm Roy Salmon. And welcome to Family 360. Conversations exploring life together. Marcus, thank you so much for coming into the studio today. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. (laughs) Now, as I was preparing for this interview, I have discovered you as somebody who I believe has a deep desire for bringing unity between people. But at the same time, you have quite a diverse background. So I'm looking forward to digging into that. (laughs) So you are a singer, an actor, a writer, a producer, and you were recently inducted into the Entertainment Hall of Fame. Wow. It is wow, isn't it? Who is that guy? (laughs) So that's a pretty awesome guy. (laughs) But then you've also been a chaplain during the Vietnam War, working with people with drug addictions. Yeah. And you were homeless. I was, yes. So you're complex. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou is a phrase from Terence Africanus. He was an African who was enslaved back in third century, I think. he, He bought his freedom and became a free man. But he said, I am human, therefore nothing human is alien to me. Mm -hmm. And that's my mantra in many ways. Anything that comes out of your heart can come out of mine, both Mm -hmm. good and bad. That's our commonality. And when we can see that, then we can begin to relate to each other. When I can see that there is nothing, I can never point my finger at you and say, I would never do that. Mm -hmm. Because that's in me. But the thing is, is to choose another way. So rather than judging, say, okay, I've got that in me. How do I respond? Hmm. Well, and you have a lot in you because you've experienced a lot. So before... 66 years. <laughs> Are you 66? Yes. Wow. Okay, well, just for the listening audience, you do not look like you're 66. I would say like 50. But anyways, I'm going to start... Oh, stop. stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, before we go into all these conversations, yeah. can I start with an opening question that we use just to give a background to who you are? Are you ready? You're breathing deeply. Here's the question. Aristotle stated, give me a child until they're seven and I will show you the adult. Is there a story or experience from your childhood that has shaped the adult that you are today? Yeah. When you mentioned this before, I had a couple of things that came to mind and I've been sort of vacillating back and forth. Mm -hmm. But the one that keeps coming and it, it wasn't exactly at seven. It was a little bit earlier. 
Okay. But I lived on a farm when I was a child. Hmm. And I never knew my biological father. He and my mom separated before I was born. But she had another partner, and he was my, quote, stepfather. And I remember as a child trying to figure out how to bond with him. Hmm. But I didn't know how to do that. We were you on... even aware that you were trying to do that? Yeah. You I were... was hmm. Yeah, I was trying to get close to him. Hmm. And this was in pre-civil rights Texas, so it was Jim Crow, Texas. Very dangerous, very hostile place. We lived in a little one-room shack in the back of this big white house. Nobody lived in that house. We weren't allowed to live in it. We had to live in this clapboard kind of shack. I remember the day we put a hole in the wall and put a hydrant in to make have running water in the house. That mm-hmm. tells you how poor we were. Anyway, to make a long story short, the house had a screen door, and the screen door had a spring on it so that it would close, you know, stay closed. I remember sitting on the floor in the the little shack, and my stepfather had just come home for lunch. He had been out in the field plowing, and I'd worked up my courage, and I remember calling him Daddy Mm. because I just wanted to— you wanted to use that name. I wanted to use that word, mm. to call him daddy. I thought I was doing something special. And he turned at me and yelled at me and said, I am not your father. Mm. And he turned around and walked out the door, and the screen door slammed. Mm. And I remember sitting there on the floor, and some part of me broke mm. and went up here above my head like an observer. Mm. And I began to live my life with that relationship, sort of an observer who was on the outside looking in. And that experience, I think, has influenced and informed a lot of my journey of my life, becoming an observer, feeling on the outside, and trying to figure out how to get in. Hmm. In times like these, we need to be strong. We need to carry on. That is quite a story. Thank you. Marcus, I know you've championed music as therapy, as an important part of finding our way of finding our belonging. And I know that music is a huge part of your life. Yeah. Do you think that is connected to your childhood journey, feeling like an outsider and trying to fit in? I think it's connected. I think yeah. it's it's part of it, uh, of course. Yeah, I, I well, I was introduced the concept music therapy through a friend and I thought I know that I had that experience like you'd felt that therapy happening in your own life I had not only felt it but I had been engaged in doing it just through the experience of music in your own life in my own life and I saw the parallels the more we talked about it I, I could see this really fits how experientially I see my life can you explain some of those parallels well one of the first things that was taught was within each person there is a musical child. That's a central tenet of music therapy. And the idea is that if the therapist can connect with that musical child, you can then begin to build a therapeutic relationship, whether it's a child with autism or whether it's a senior who's in Alzheimer's or in various stages of dementia, if you can connect with that musical child, oftentimes they can become animated and they connect with themselves. Example, put a bass drum in the middle of a room with an autistic child and just sit there and go boom, boom. And then if they do a boom, you do one. Mm -hmm. You do two, and if they do two, then you start to build a relationship. They're coming out of their isolation. And for a moment, you can create a time of bringing them out to experience the world around them. If dealing with a person who's got Alzheimer's, if you can find some music that was very popular during some time in their life, start to sing it to them. And it's amazing. This person who's been sitting almost in a vegetative state will suddenly begin to hum along, and they will sing the whole song, all the lyrics, and they'll be dancing with you, they'll be swaying with you, smiling, present. Their quality of life is enriched by that experience, right? And you could identify with that kind of enrichment through music. I totally identified with it because I had already been doing a lot of that. And whenever I stand before an audience, that is part of my internal process. I want to get out of the way, be sensitive to what's going on in the room, and hopefully be able to say something, do something that's going to have an impact on people in the audience, individuals in the audience. Hmm. 
just before we move on, Marcus, can I just go back to ask you just a little bit of a question about your childhood experience? Sure. How did music come into your young life? How did you discover its power to heal you or to comfort you? Okay. Those who have seen me in concert over the years, I very, very often talk about my mom. And how she always had a song going underneath her lips. She would always be humming a tune or singing a song very softly when she was working out in the fields. She also was a housekeeper. So when we would go to these white people's homes and she would clean their homes, she always had a song going. I observed that. And so to me, breaking into song was like breathing. And so it was nothing for me. I, in fact, I would be out in the field and I would just sing at the top of my lungs to the cows, the plants, the trees, whatever. It was That was me. Do you think that's part of the musical child inside of you? Absolutely. Yeah, but you were like, you were giving it voice. Absolutely. To break free. That's when I discovered my inner voice. Mm. It was my inner higher voice. And I learned over the years that when I listened to it, things go well out on the farm and singing out loud, that was my way of connecting. And that's what I learned about my mom. The reason she would sing all the time is because it was her way of staying connected and focused and centered in her spirituality, her sense of God, so that if somebody came at her with some slurs or with something that was hostile, which was not uncommon, she could keep her peace. She could know how to respond in that given situation. So I learned that from her by example. I watched her do it day in and day out. And it became a practice for me. Everybody needs something. Everybody needs someone. Everybody has a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who's got a friend of a friend. You're, you've been talking about we all have a musical child inside of us. How do you keep that child alive even into teen years, how do you nurture that kind of vulnerability to sing wildly in the fields and and not feel embarrassed about that yeah. when, you're, when you're a teenager? <laughs> but it is normal to put on a headset and start listening to music, loving to spend the whole day listening to music. How do you trace the therapy of music through those years? One of the things for me was the changes, all of the, those big emotional changes are inside you and to find a way to put that to sound. And sometimes a song would resonate like, oh yeah, this song is expressing this aspect of what I'm feeling in my heart. And so when I sing it, it's not just a feeling inside, but it becomes externalized. I'm mm. saying it to the world. I'm saying it to the universe. Well, and as a teen, you don't have the words sometimes no. to put that in place. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And music can do that for you. Yeah, when I felt like nobody else understood what I was feeling, that if I could sing it, if I could put it into sound, that would ease some of the pain, the struggling. Mm. That was my connection to God or to my inner voice, was to be able to put whatever was going on in my gut inside my spirit, putting it into sound. I was listening to another interview you did, and you said this, art, and I'm especially thinking music in this case, art helps us get in touch with our commonalities. Yeah. And reminds us about who we are and what we aspire to be. What to you is the necessity of getting in touch with our commonalities? When we find out at the core that we're the same, then we can relate to each other. We're not divided. When I can see you, when I can see myself in you, or to make it even bigger, when I can see God in you, when I can see my humanity in you, then I can relate to you. We can, we can have a conversation. We can, we can dance. We can sing. We can do the things that I think humans are meant to do. And art and music are gifts that are given to us, places that we can discover that with each other. Sometimes we're not ready to have a conversation, a verbal conversation, but sometimes a song, a piece of music playing where I can see you go, oh, and, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm doing that at the same place. Then we have that moment of mm -hmm. like, I connect, I get it, and you get me. We're not that different. See all. All of my life, the message that I've gotten is that I'm other. Mm. 
So my journey has been to call out, to say, no, I'm just like you. Unfortunately, I wasted a portion of my life defining myself in the negative. I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that. But I wasn't affirming who I am. Mm. And that was all because of fear and all kinds of other stuff. But basically, the core of it is, you're like me, I'm like you, and here's how we're the same. So I just put my heart out there, and I'll sing about vulnerability, I'll sing about alienation, I'll sing about fear and trust and love. Someone will resonate to that, because I'm singing it from a place of, of knowing what that feels like. That's what I love about gospel music. Gospel music gives me the platform to share those emotions and they are supported on a foundation that is built in the black experience mm -hmm. in North America. Gospel music does seem to transcend culture and experience yeah. and, and uh, religious belief, non-religious belief yeah. in a really unique way. Why do you think that is? Because it comes from a real experience, a real deep experience of suffering, of oppression, that it uh, it's finding a way in the in the depths of oppression mm. to still find a way to look up and to find joy, to find purpose, to find direction, to find comfort or solace. The experience in the black church is, I remember growing up as we were living in hostile territory, you know, where outside the building, separate bathrooms, step off the sidewalk when white people are walking by, uh, separate water fountains, segregated schools. People would look at you and tell you that you were nothing. You were, use you were less than human. But in that space, everybody was equal. Mm. And everybody stood before God, as it were, and we sang our hearts out. And we encouraged each other. And as a child, you, 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 children have a very special place in there and you're encouraged to get up and sing, get up and speak out and there. That's all right, baby. If you make a mistake, they'll go, that's all right, baby. Just keep on singing, you know, but they embraced you with encouragement to be. And I think that's part of the power of gospel music. I know that it can be dogmatic. Some people can take it in a direction of trying to preach at people. But my experience of coming through the civil rights era was the, the music became a reflection of a desire. I want to be free. I want to have the same freedoms as anybody else. I think that's a human experience universally, the desire to, to overcome, the desire to connect, the desire to be free, the desire to not be on the bottom, to see endless possibilities as opposed to your life is stuck and this is all it's going to be. Mm. So I think that's part of the power of gospel music. And that's why I do it. It can be so joyous. It can be so joyous. And in fact, in my old Pentecostal church, I mean, gospel music was designed for one thing and one thing only, to bring you to the place of ecstasy so that you can transcend your present experience and get to a higher experience. We used to say, if you don't feel it, they're not going to feel it. Mm. So you have to sing it from a real place. If you're going to do it right, you have to sing it to where it is real to you, coming from a real place. Everybody, everybody, yeah, need someone they can lean on. Everybody knows to lean on someone. So as someone who's listened to gospel music, I think that I can sometimes think that music is so soulful, it's so amazing, and it comes from a place in the past where people suffered. Yeah. But clearly it's not in the past. No. Can you talk to me about that? I think there is a deep and rich and dark past. But I also think that in North America especially, we, we still haven't dealt with that past. Mm. There are still things that are just so painful to look into on both sides of that discussion. As, as we raise our children, yeah. I think we like to believe or to hope that every generation strives to do things better, strives to love better. Yeah. 
but there's always there's obviously so much more to learn as we look at raising this next generation of children. How do we raise children to see that interconnection that you're talking about? How do we raise children in touch with our commonalities? I think number one, you model it. You show them. You live it yourself in front of them. I think of individuals in my life who were living and walking in that truth. And what did how, that look like? Uh, again, going back to my mom, I observed her and how she went through her life. She would have somebody be very abusive to her verbally or whatever, and she would deal with it. I'm not saying she was a doormat because she was not. She's a very strong woman, but having this song going under her lips and when the onslaught happened, she was ready and she would just deal with it and move on and the song would continue. And I observed that that gave her an equilibrium in her life. Kids watch us and they learn by what we do more than by what we say. Mm, that is so true. Uh, Even in response to discrimination and prejudice. Yeah. What's the character? What are the actions of somebody who looks beyond difference to see yeah. what's common or to see the in inherent value in others? Oh, that's a good question. How do I... Uh, someone who's willing to say, I don't know, but I'm willing to try. I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm in. Willing to say I'm sorry. They're willing to say, I don't know. Mm. Somebody asked me, so, Marcus, how do you feel about Canada, you know, and you're telling us about all this racism and the, all this experience out in the States. What do you think about, about Canada? And I was very honest. I said, racism is alive and well in Canada. And this man stood up and he was angry. He goes, if you feel that way, why don't you go back to the States? There's no racism here. And, and he goes, I've got black friends. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm just sharing with you my experience and my observation that racism does exist here. It's, it takes a different form and it takes a willingness to be able to see it. Just because you have a black person come to your house doesn't mean you don't have things to work on. I met this young white woman by the name of Penny and we just really kind of connected. We just were just like, we just really kind of got each other. And we were having great conversations and she looked at me and I could see a light bulb go off in her head and her jaw kind of dropped. And she said, you people really can think. Wow. And it was like slow motion there for me. And I thought, wow, she really said that. Yeah. She had been raised to see black people in a certain way. She still held racist views. She still saw me in a certain way, through a certain lens. But through our interaction, that shifted. And for her to say, you people really can think, what I got from that was, from that day forward, when she got married, when she had children, she was going to raise her children with a different view of the world. So I felt like something wonderful had happened. Mm -hmm. She was able to see more of my humanity, that I was like her. Well, there's a choice in that moment not to take offense. I, it could have, yeah. yeah. I mean, other people said, when I told that story, people, you didn't get mad. No, I didn't because I guess I sensed in the moment that something was happening and it was wonderful. Uh, I, I, Is that part of what you're talking about, fighting for your commonalities then? Yeah. That's a, is that a sacrifice play? That's, that's a hard one. Yeah. I have a this. I'm, I've been formulating this idea that whatever it is that you need, give it. Because I think there's a myth that there's not enough. There's a myth of scarcity that pervades in the world. Mm. There's abundance in the world. Everything we need is here if we access it. So if I want love, I give love. If I want compassion, I must give compassion. If I want to see joy in the world, I must give that. That's where it starts. So, I mean, uh, it starts with addressing that myth of scarcity. Yes, absolutely. To dismiss it, it is not true. It's a lie. It's a myth. It's not real. But everything around us 
is reinforcing that every day. But there's not enough. There's not enough. You're not enough. Honestly, there is abundance. We all are looking for love. We're all looking for connection, intimacy. In times like these, we need to find a way to make a better day. Keep our feet on the ground, turn it round, come what may. You sing a song entitled In Times Like These. Yeah. From your perspective, what do you see in these times that makes this song timely? I think that we are in perilous times right now. There is this division that is happening in the world where people are becoming tribal, nationalistic. What do you mean by tribal? Tribalism, yeah, it comes down to us and them. It comes down to my people, our people, those who think like me and look like me. We have to keep ourselves safe from y'all, whoever y'all are, them, those folks out there. And that divides, that separates, that creates a sense of a gulf between us. Mm -hmm. And what's important and very, very needed now is something that says, no, we're in this together. We are connected. The myth of scarcity, the second myth is separation. Mm -hmm. We're not separate. We are connected on this planet. We need each other to survive. That's our hope. Yeah. Oh, okay. So with that in mind, and knowing that we need to start to wrap up, how do we actualize that hope? You've said we may not be able to see eye to eye, but we can see heart to heart. How do you, Marcus, how do you have a heart that's open to connection? How do you keep it there? Oof. It can be painful. Uh, having an open heart means you're open to the possibility of of being betrayed, of being hurt, of being misunderstood, of being rejected. And, and sometimes we close those areas off because we don't want to feel that degree of pain. Sometimes trauma can do it. In my case, it was abuse. It was other things which really hurt me, and so it made me pull away. But I, I think we start by being willing by having the willingness to take that journey. The journey to connection? Yeah. It can feel chaotic. It can feel threatening. But it's important to make that journey because everything that we suppress and hold back, it's like carrying around 10-pound weights. You're wondering why you're burdened down. It's because you're carrying all this stuff. So how does, how does connection release the burden? I think it's connected deeply with our inner life, our inner voice, that inner part of us. Um, if you want to call it God, if you want to call it spirit, if you want to call it our higher self, that is always calling us. Come deeper. Deep uh, calls to deep. Deep calls, calls unto deep. deep. And for me, one of the things that, that has always represented, one of the physical things that have represented God to me is the ocean. Mm. That it, it covers the world and it's so powerful, it's so deep, it's so immense. But yet you can stand and put your feet in it and be connected to it and thereby be connected to the whole world. We're all looking for that sense of belonging, of, of real intimacy, of real connectedness. This is what you're looking for. It's there. Mm. Marcus, thank you so much for going deep, for our conversation, for sharing like this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to kind of revisit again some of those places. And thank you for, for listening. And <laughs> I'm glad we had this time. Thank you. Over these last few days, we've reflected in our episodes this season, mm -hmm. without exception, every person of color we've interviewed mm -hmm. has included at least one comment about discrimination yeah. or belonging in our conversation yeah. with them, without exception. Yeah. And even though that's not even been the topic of our interview. 
yeah, those realities have very naturally worked their way into our conversations, whatever the conversation has been, which is telling. Yeah, and you and I were actually discussing this as we were mm-hmm. editing this episode for Marcus. Well, because while we were editing the recent widespread outrage of the killing of George Floyd, this past month was on our minds. And it challenged us to listen differently. Mm-hmm. And it brought to mind these words by philosopher Cornell West. Justice is what love looks like in public. Mm -hmm. And Marcus alludes to this as an antidote to the myth of scarcity in our lives and how we show love, compassion. And justice. Yeah, suggesting a commitment to listening with more informed and compassionate ears. Mm. So thank you, Marcus. For your generous sharing of your life and experience. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Family 360. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Rate the show, leave a comment, and tell a friend. Each Family 360 episode ends with music inspired by the words of our guest. And this week, the music is our guest. You heard bits and pieces of this music during this interview. Here's Marcus Mosley singing his song in times like these. And you can find it in our resource section for every episode or wherever you stream music. In times like these, we need to be strong. We need to carry on. We need to get along, hold on, and right what's wrong. In times like these, we need to find a way to make a better day. Keep our feet on the ground, turn it round, come what may. Everybody. 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 Yeah, need someone they can lean on. Everybody wants to lean on someone. Everybody. Yeah. There's no way not to care There's no one anywhere Who doesn't feel it in their hearts Gotta make a new start In times like these Let the world understand Together, hand in hand Every woman, child, man United we stand I'm Rachel Cram. I'm Roy Salmond. And thank you so much for listening to Family 360. 360. To continue these conversations, find us at Family 360 on our website, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'd love to journey with you.